I'm Alex. I'm James. And I'm Dan. We're the Ragamuffins, and this is episode 40 of the Ragamuffin Music Podcast. It's a place for us to talk about the music we love. On this episode, we're reviewing brand new EPs from North Lane and on People, as well as singles from Not Loose, Graphic Nature, and more. And later on, we'll be talking about album artwork, some of our favourites, and some iconic ones. But first, let's talk about last episode's album recommendations. Dan, let's start with you this time. What did you recommend? I can't remember the name of the album I recommended. <laughs> I, re- I recommended an album that came out of nowhere for me. It's Freeco's Where We've Been, Where We Go From Here. Interested to hear what you boys thought. I um, I feel like I wanted, I wanted myself to like it more than I did, if that makes sense. Like, I feel yeah. like on paper I should have enjoyed it a lot. But uh, there was something about it that was just, like, holding me back. I don't know. It was weird. But th- what I did like about it, that it felt very kind of timeless in the sense that it, like, was a really good blend of, like, nostalgic sort of songwriting. But then, at the same time, it felt very modern as well. It was weird. It was, like, a real... That's why I struggled to give examples of stuff it's similar to. Yeah. Because it blends so many different influences, clearly, and just... Does its own thing. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Uh, maybe I need just like to really have like months with it. Do you know what I mean? To really sink maybe. in. But I don't know. It it didn't like grab me as much as I kind of hoped it would. Unfortunately. That's a shame. Pretty much the same with me as well. Damn it. Um, yeah. It just didn't kind of strike me as something. I, I, I liked how each of the songs were quite different. I felt. But there wasn't anything in there that just like really pulled me in and was like getting me to want to give it many repeat listens, unfortunately. So I'm sorry. That's fair I enough. I feel bad. Alex, what did you recommend? I recommended Darker Still by Parkway Drive. I was a big fan of some of their earlier stuff, particularly Deep. What was it called? Deep Blue and Atlas, those albums. I think that's what it was called. But I kind of fell off a bit in the recent years, so I thought it'd be a good chance to try the more recent stuff. Um, it was all right. It was sort of what I expected, like, a band that are, like, of the age and the generation that they're of to be doing at this point in their career. So I don't think I was, like, disappointed that it wasn't insanely heavy or, like... It wasn't even, like... It wasn't even really, like, proper metalcore like their old stuff was it was just like a good metal album um which is fine so it's kind of what i expected and it's what i got so i i I enjoyed it i'm pretty much the same um i've mentioned a few times recently that metal and metalcore in particular has to has to be doing something attention grabbing and something different to really like intrigue me at the moment and this album doesn't really do that but at the same time it doesn't really do anything wrong um, you can't really knock Parkway Drive or anything. They've been around for a long time. They kind of know what they're doing, and it's it's a solid album, but just not one that is going to be much of a re- on repeat one for me. I don't think. think. I've never really delved into them as a band, and I think with this, I maybe had certain expectations of what to get out of it, and I I, I get where you guys are coming from, being like, kind of, this is where they would be at. But I think maybe because those expectations are not really listening to much, I expected a lot more myself from it. And so I, it felt like a bit of a letdown. There were points throughout it where I was like, oh, okay, that jams, that's quite cool, good riffs and that. But it didn't feel like a strong release from what I expected of a band that after kind of seeing what they produced at Download last year, the crowd's response and everything, I expected something that was going to kind of blow me away a little bit more and I didn't really get that and I left feeling a bit disappointed and again kind of unengaged to try and delve into it further um maybe just it was much more heightened in what I expected um so I maybe I should delve into it a little bit more but they just seem to have passed me by and there's like a I find when sometimes when you have that from a band with a latter release there's a lack of desire and excitement to then try and delve back when you've heard something disappointing sometimes which is a real shame because their early stuff's really good 
Maybe I'll, maybe we'll give it a bit of time, and after festival season, I might recommend an earlier Parkway album. We, can we shall see. Mm. Try again later. Uh, and I recommend an album you both knew already. Uh, kind of a little bit of download prep for us, Dan, with Electric Callboy with Techno. Da, I'm very da, excited da, 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 to see them da, on that second da, stage. Da, da, da. Keep going. Ah. No? Uh, yeah, it's just, just such, such a fun band, such a fun album. And I, I don't really know what to say about it because it's not a serious album. There's, no. It's not really open to criticism. Um, but we'll, we'll, what I will say is to do... I can't remember who I heard say it before, but to do parody well, you've got to be a master of your craft already. And Electric Callboy do parody very well, a, v- a very self-aware band, a very unserious band, but they, they know exactly what they're marketing towards, they know exactly what they're doing, and it's just an album full of absolute bangers that are so much fun and are going to be incredible at download. Yeah, I can't really add much more than that. I think what stood out to me was how good and I think underrated like the deep cuts on this album are because so much of like for me when I think about Electric Callboy my immediate thoughts obviously go to like pretty much um, so it was good to just like really enjoy and like really soak in some of the deeper cuts in this album um, and like Dan said like they sort of are able to parody and like be so self-aware of what they're doing that it's yeah it's just brilliant and they it goes in so many different places like you've got songs like fuck boy which is kind of like a i don't know it's more like a, a pop punk side to them yeah in a way. It, yeah kind of and then there's a song like um spaceman which is obviously very heavy on like like predominantly being in german and also like with the, with the rap and like the feature on it as well i think yeah, they sort of maximise the fun at every possible uh, avenue and like nothing ever o- feels like it's overstayed as welcome or like a joke never sort of runs out of steam. Like I think they're really good at pacing. Like we did there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, train. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Didn't even think of that. <laughs> um, no, I like it. Very good. I th- I'd like to see them live. I think it'd be really fun. A great thing as well that I'll just mention is as you as you were naming some of the song titles then, they were just appearing in my head, like the the riffs from them or whatever hooks and, and stuff they planted in them. So everything they do works. Like as soon as you, like words are associated with them now. I hear the word spaceman and I'm going, spaceman. <laughs> it's, yeah. Hurricane's yeah. the one for me that I immediately <laughs> think of like the little piano intro and stuff. <laughs> and I agree with you like on the deep cuts. I found that kind of going back to it more like Mind Reader was a song that stood out to me more as well. Um, yeah, very enjoyable album. Should we talk about some new music instead? New m- 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 music. First up, we've got a new song from Knock Loose, third single from the upcoming album, and it is Suffocate featuring Poppy. This came out like de- two days de- ago. Two days ago, at the time of recording. And it is feral. Like, it is the textbook definition of a feral release of energy um poppy's feature is like is not what i was expecting it to be no i don't think it's excellent i think it's brilliant i think if she adds like a dynamic to this song that is what makes it what it is if that makes sense because i was expecting it to probably be like some sort of a, like clean singing and like maybe like a proper chorus or something but um for her to just be like screaming her head off and being like matching brian's like energy and like mm. raw just sort of delivery style was brilliant and then that breakdown using like a reggaeton beat in hardcore is ludicrous it almost shouldn't be allowed but they seem to be able to get away with whatever the fuck they want so yeah i think it's brilliant is it is it my favorite single so far i feel like i need more time Too soon but to i say. think that it may they said on their socials i think the best not loose song well, this, well, this in, one, in, in, yeah, in promotion of this, the best mm. not loose song is now released or whatever. That's always going to be subjective, I suppose, isn't it? But um, that's that's not me saying I don't like this song. Yeah. I love this song. I think it's amazing. Um, but I think comparing it to the other three singles is the, the other two singles rather is is unfair because they all bring something different to the table. They they all do something kind of different and yeah. bring something one of 
Nox Loose's qualities to like each song. And I think on on this one in particular, the the feature is just a, a perfect marriage, basically. Because Nox Loose are known for making like disgusting, like aggressive and and difficult to listen to hardcore music. Poppy also, even if you go way back to when she was just doing YouTube videos, they were deliberately creepy and difficult to watch. So put marrying those two things together is amazing, I think. I can't agree with anything. Sorry, I can't disagree with <laughs> what? anything either of you have said there because it's all just spot on. I think like you said, the marriage for it is perfect. The The way they match their energy is like you said, Alex, I think just helps elevate the song. One thing I want to highlight from this track and I think all of them that is literally the driving force into something amazingly unique and I think it's Paxton's drumming. I think there's like an elevation in what he's doing in the performances that is really pushing these songs to another level. Um, the variety we're getting in these singles makes me hella fucking excited for this album. And from what they've said, like with the press release and how diverse they're trying to go for it, trying new things, it's working. And they can literally right now probably do whatever the hell they want and it's going to hit. Because you can tell they're putting the care, the time into it. Um, writing incredible music and thank fuck labels aren't being controlling in terms of what they're doing. They could say to them, we want 20 more songs like Counting Worms for algorithms and shit, whereas they're doing whatever they want to write and it's perfect. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, I, th there's not a lot really you can do to big up a band or recommend a band more or think of a band who are hitting every marker correct right now more than not loose they are not putting a foot wrong it, it's as simple as that yeah i said when we we reviewed one of their other recent singles as well like every time a new not loose song comes out we're blown away by it and then we're like well what the hell are they going to do next and then they release something else it's like fair enough yep that's answered that question they've blown us away what the hell are they going to do next? Where do they go from here? Mm -hmm. And they, every single time they raise the bar and then they just keep raising it every time, seemingly. We've got a new single from Better Lovers, The Flowering. Now, I, I did like it. I felt like it didn't quite live up to God Made Me an Animal. I think that that was so amazing in itself that this had a lot to live up to. I did think it was fantastic. It's everything you kind of want from them with the chaotic energy, fantastic riffs. But I feel it just fell short of the mark in terms of what i wanted out of it now um very enjoyable energetic as fuck and i'm i really want to see them live at trees but it just it's hard because it's it's a hard one to criticize because i did love it but yeah it just wasn't i look back at it i look back at previous release and i just think they've done this but better i don't know if they're releasing music too quickly at the moment because like for me this doesn't stand out amongst the other songs they've released so far mm. um and I, I guess maybe maybe their like aim is just they're having fun they'll just release music whenever they want but yeah for, for me it's a bit like a oh this is exciting there's a new, new better lover song and it's when it's not as good as the other stuff it's a bit like oh, well I'll, I'll just stick to these other songs I wonder if it's thing. a product of obviously they're all like kind of pre-existing and notable people that because they're kind of catching wind a little bit and getting booked for shows quite a lot that they're almost like we need to get more songs out there for people to know. Yeah, well, that's well, exactly what I was going to yeah, say. From yeah. a marketing perspective, it is the way that uh, a new band gets out there. Just release single after single, get yourself in playlists. So yeah, they're not necessarily doing the wrong thing. It's, yeah, just in terms of my enjoyment, personally. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it feels like they're rushing stuff out, perhaps. Yeah, I don't think this this stands out beyond what was on the EP. But I still like it. I, to be honest, to me, and there's not really anything that they... There's nothing they can do about it, but their best song was their first song so far. So okay. everything is still trying to measure up to 30 under 13. And when it doesn't, there's like an, my, my immediate reaction is like kind of disappointment. And then I have to like correct myself and think, actually, no. 
that song bangs. That it's song quite is, hard to live up that to. That song is insane. Maybe I'm still in the disappointment phase. Yeah. Maybe I'll get there. But you know, it's a good song. It's a, you know another song to recognise by the time their tree set comes around. So I'm still happy in it. In it. In it. Graphic nature. Fuck it. To the, the grave. Ah. Go for it. What do you think? I predicted at the start of this year that um, they would release a new album in 2024. And I think I even said, oh, it might be kind of too soon. But a bit of a quick turnaround considering that um, the first album was the start of 2023. But can I just, before we get into the review of this, I was right. I said, they, they need to cap, they've been working so hard as far as like their live show goes that they need like a new body of music out to start injecting into their live shows and they well done me you did a fantastic and job well done them because it and, slaps and you know what their previous album mm. has just been nominated for a, a heavy music award congrats well deserved. Much deserved. Well deserved. Should win. I'll be voting for them I have voted already for them <laughs> to add uh, to Alex's prediction of them releasing a new album I just thought we should mention that we chatted to them after their show at the Bullingdon a couple of weeks ago I mentioned to them uh, as we were just leaving I'll and any anything in the works coming in the next few next few weeks, next couple of months that that we can talk about? And Harvey went, can neither confirm nor deny. Literally, and then two literally days later, or? I think it was a day later they put a teaser out. The day after that, front cover of Kerrang, new song. Yep. Day after that, new albums announced. Could have given yeah. us the exclusive. Damn it, Harvey! Could Come on, could have just told us, mate. But. No, by, by the time we'd leaked any information about it, it would have already <laughs> been announced anyway. Yeah. But the song, To The Grave. It bangs. It's, it's just what you want now, isn't it? I, again, almost akin to saying what I said about Not Loose. I don't feel like Graphic Nature are putting a step wrong with anything they're doing. Everything seems to happen at the right time. It's It's beautifully organic. There is nothing where I'm kind of like with any release there's any apprehension or i wonder if it's going to perform it just feels like it's a solid get straight away that yep the song's going to absolutely bang they put the time into it the way they kind of merge everything and and have a different i feel slight spin on new metal as a genre as well i, oh, think I, was, I saw a comment somewhere i think it was on one of our tiktok videos saying that um graphic nature aren't a new metal band so, well, what are they then if they're not? Define this, them, please. This is, this is so new metal. It is. It, it's part of that modern day wave of it with them, with Tala and stuff like that. It, it's part of that modern wave. It's that spin on it. You can kind of hear the homage back to that stuff of the early 2000s. But they bring something else entirely to it and it, it fucking slaps. I think as well, I, I know there were, um, there was a, a lot of drum and bass. Well, not a lot. There was hints of drum and bass included on the previous album. But it feels like those remixes they did was almost like them testing the waters and practicing for this new album because mm -hmm. there's way more drum and bass influence on this song and I have a feeling there's going to be more on on the album. Maybe cooking. Next, we've got Four Years Strong with Daddy of Mine. Now, I'm not a massive Four Years Strong, I guess, fan. I haven't listened to a lot of the years, so I'm kind of leaning on you guys. And where where do you think this lines up compared to previous releases by them? This is really cool and kind of a bit of a change up, I think. Like, they've always been very good at, at doing that easy core blend of kind of starting songs as a pop punk song and then bringing in sort of some heavier influences towards the end. But this goes like straight out of the blocks with just sounding heavy and hard. And I think it's really cool. Yeah, super cool. It was really unexpected, to be honest. Mm. Um, there weren't. They didn't seem to e e even be any sort of clues or indication that they were no, kind of planning a release. Just bam, here's yeah. a heavy song for you. I like, and, it, I, and I don't yeah. mean heavy as in like not loose, but <laughs> different for heavy for them. But there, yeah, kind of where they're at. Yeah, for this kind of style, it's heavy. It's riffy. I found it a refreshing kind of song. To be fair, mm. it didn't feel like they. I could compare them to like much else that's going around at the minute. It felt unique to them i'd heard and i've like heard bits and pieces over the years of them uh mostly i think from stuff of is the album enemy of the world yeah yeah i've heard bits from that album i think um great, great album. i think you played that a lot growing up i Alex. think i probably recommended it Might yeah i'm sure well it's been recommended on the podcast 
But um, no, I found this like really refreshing and a, a really enjoyable one that I could go back and re-listen to quite a lot, which was, it was a nice kind of thing to go for, for a band that even for me being aware of have been around for quite some time. So, I mean, does it feel like a reinvention in a way? Kind of. It's also kind of throwbacky because mm. they definitely started off like the heavier end of Easy Core in earlier stuff. And then it did like naturally kind of soften up not in a bad way, but like in just a natural evolution sort of way. So it was kind of surprising because the most recent album, which was 2020, didn't have a whole lot on it that was like this. It has kind of come yeah. come out of nowhere. Um, but I love it, yeah. I really, really like it. Oh, I'd love to see them again. They were so good. When was the last time you saw them? Slam dunk. They need to do a proper tour in the UK at some point. It's been a, a hot minute since they've done a full tour. There's been a lot of... Ba- it's kind of sort of a a hangover from the pandemic I think there are so many bands of, of this sort of size that just haven't been properly here for a tour for so long it's just been like things like Slam Dunk or the download or whatever but um, I'll tell you what popped into my mind the other day actually when listening to the song and I don't think they are but they'd be a sick outbreak headliner mm. they'd be really good at trees as well Trees, trees, cave headliner. Yeah, I reckon so. Oh, God, a forest set. Because they do, they do some great acoustic don't, stuff as don't well. Don't get Alex is, up now. Imagine, right? Imagine this though. Imagine the forest set is, uh, you know, Wednesday. Enemy of the enemy of the world set, and then just a normal set over the weekend at some point in the weekend. James from Two Thousand Trees, if you're listening, please Four make it strong. happen. Four years strong for trees next year would be. Unreal. Let's do it. Come on, I manifested the Have Heart reunion for Outbreak this year. I can, <laughs> we can do that. You become our festival predictor. I want that, and I want Block Party. I was gonna say we'll put Block Party out there again as well. Block Party at Trees next year, please. Uh, next up is One Chance by Black Gold. Thoughts, Alex. Thoughts, Dan. Here they are. Um, just have a bit of fun. You gotta have a bit of fun every now and then. Do you know what I mean not every band can be? super serious with a, gr- a really important message otherwise it, it things would be boring bands like this have to exist and the people yearn for new metal we've just talked about graphic nature and this is like y- if you approach this with the same mindset that you would approach like Biscuit, you will enjoy this song yeah it, it's that simple like it is just fun it's a throwback it's got cheesy lyrics but it's it's good it's really good it's an earworm and um i'd love to see it live yeah i got no complaints no notes you just have to have the right attitude to be able to be receptive to this song i think is all it comes down to yeah yeah bang on because when i first listened to it i think i was thinking too much into it i was like don't know what i think about this it's a, it's a bit too throwbacky it sounds like it would have been from that kind of era but then I kind of chilled out a bit, li- revisited it, and was like, you know what? Yeah, it's good. Mm. It's a good song. If I think it sounds like it's from that era, then it's a good song. That's probably what they've aimed for. Yeah. So, yeah, it's good fun. They're a good fun live band as well. So, this will be a welcome addition to the set. No, I completely agree, to be honest, as I'm trying to pull up the lyrics. Because there's one point, there's one bit I want to highlight. I think when you've kind of got the lyrics surrounding black belts kung fu and jean-claude van damme in there you know you just you can't take that seriously like you say i think it's just meant for a lot of fun i didn't make the limp biscuit kind of comparison until you did alex but i think it is actually quite fitting um and it goes weirdly quite hard at one point kind of as we're getting towards the end of it almost breakdowny with that i think it'll be a lot of fun live um i think they are at burn it down yes they are at burn they're it burned down. down i was correct yeah I like that will be I think them and ten fifty six I would probably say are my two most anticipated sets for that. I think they will be a lot of fun live. Um yeah. Very enjoyable from the two times I've seen them before. All 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 down for some new metal fun. Next up is Chaotic by Memphis May Fire. Crazy. You're you're Chaotic, a throwback fan, you Alex. Say. Pardon? You're a throwback fan. I am a throwback fan. I enjoyed the Challenger album and 
Matty Mullins' solo music, as you showed me earlier. <laughs> oh, no. It, if you were around when Matty Mullins was doing his solo music in the 2010s, you deserve financial compensation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I liked Memphis Mayfire when I was a teenager, and as you do, you grow out of things. So I stopped listening to them. And this is maybe the first one I've listened to in years, but it was an earworm. Really, actually, really good. I don't know if we talked about it on the podcast or if we talked about it off air, but we've talked uh, amongst the three of us about Sirius XM. Core, yeah, I brought it up before. Yeah, uh, you know, bands that write music that's kind of radio metalcore, basically. And this is part of that. And that's fine. It's sort of like Wage War, Bad Omens, uh, Beartooth, Modern Beartooth, sort of in that world. And it's fun. I I liked it. I thought it was pretty good. The breakdown was filthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just an interesting, interesting song. It was not, it was weird. Like, again, I've not really delved into much of their stuff before knowing that you had. And for me, I found this really quite enjoyable. Again, you got to take it for what it is with it. Heavy at those really, really nice points, the breakdowns. But my initial thoughts were listening to it. It sounded so much like Wage War. I, if you'd have told me like this was a Wage War song and I didn't know it was them, I would absolutely believe you straight away. I did, however, find it very enjoyable. I'm intrigued. I might have to delve into a little bit more Memphis Mayfire, so I might need your guidance with that, Alex. Um, yeah. Take it for what it is. Right, EPs. EP, EP. You with us, Alex? First GP to talk about is Mirror's Edge by North Lane. First thing that this made me think of was the game, Mirror's Edge. And then you realised a bit earlier on you couldn't get it for your iPhone anymore and you were quite no, disappointed. No longer on the App Store, only got supported up to iOS 7, which is pathetic. So, yeah, once I got past that, I listened to the EP. <laughs> um, I like North Lane. I really like the the album... Obsidian. Forgot what it was called then. Uh, but I was kind of a bit whelmed by this. But I appreciate what they were trying to do. Also, they lose points because I think the cover art was AI generated. Mm-hmm, so it was. That kind of stinks, especially with this being the episode where we talk about good album art. So, um, yeah, whelmed is the is the feeling. Well, I like. If we go way back, I loved North Lane uh, because of the Singularity album. Like, that is like a cult classic, I think. As like people of a, a certain age or, or the inter sort of gent, that, that's that's like the album. That's an, a, a kind of gateway album that gets them into the genre, gets people into this kind of music. Mm. And then after that album, I didn't really listen to them for years and years. And then I really loved Obsidian. I thought that was a great album. And then this EP is great, but in a different way. Like like you said, Alex, Alex Obsidian, it's a bit like, here's some crazy time signatures, here's some crazy shit going on here, crazy breakdowns, this is heavier shit. This EP, it's almost like it's trying to build a world a bit more. And there's moments where it does it very well in like sort of the melodic moments. Um, there's still some weird time signatures and stuff in there as well, but they're not quite as jarring and as like in your face as they would be in in some of their previous releases. So yeah, I'm I'm enjoying the kind of direction they've gone in in kind of trying to be a bit melodic and world building. But also, I kind of prefer the stuff they're doing before on Obsidian and Singularity, where they just go for it. So I haven't really listened to a lot of them before. Bits that I tried to dive into hadn't actually really appealed to me, to be honest. Um, but from my point, I actually kind of enjoyed this release. I don't think there's anything I'm necessarily hurry to go back to, but I did find like parts of it, I think, where maybe some of the time signature stuff just itches a part of my brain, which I really enjoy. And I kind of like feel quite comfortable just listening to that and can sit in that for ages. So I think that like extended time with that, I'm just like, oh, okay, this is fine. This is just chill. This is what I can jam after listening to like 25 minutes of Dream Theater time signatures where it sometimes can get too much. Um, I did quite like um, some of the features throughout. I thought that they made the song stand out a little bit differently and kind of gave it a bit more variation. The song amongst. Winston McCall bangs. Yeah, I, really like I that. think that was probably my favorite. 
um but I, as a release i i didn't mind it i kind of enjoyed it and for me it was a the first north lane to be honest for me like that i actually enjoyed i think it's a good move to make it an ep yeah it feels like a bridge between albums it for me. didn't need to be any longer than it was it was mm. if anything could have been a little bit shorter maybe dropped off one one track perhaps if it was any longer i think it would have then killed it more for me it was kind of the right length and, and fi finally one. we've got the unpeople ep exciting for those of us that were pressed to miko fans and it did not disappoint. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was exactly what it's exactly what I wanted from from this project. I think based on yeah. what I liked about Prestamico and what I was expecting, um, crazy, ridiculous, fun riffs, um, massive hook hooky choruses that are real. Like that that chorus on waste when it first kicks in is huge um and it just sounds fun like it sounds fun to play it would be fun to see it live um and you know it's it's just very it's it's the same feeling i have with better lovers that you know every time i die aren't a thing anymore but it's nice that spiritually there's like yeah. a success like if it. that had to end for this to happen then but then it's that's it's, great it's okay yeah so Love it. If you like Preston Eco and haven't listened to this, listen to it because it will butter your parsnips. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely got the bits that made Preston Eco great in there. Like some of the odd time signatures, the just the fun that they, they always put into into their songwriting and, and into their songs, hooky choruses. But it's got enough in there new for it to justify being a new project as well. And yeah, I think think it's a really fun EP and a really really exciting uh, moment for the scene I think because they're they're well loved in the scene they're bands that oh well they're people that have been <laughs> people um, that have worked really hard in previous projects coming together to I think have some great success with this because they're supporting Metallica which is insane hang on what they're supporting Metallica <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I've seen this Wait a second. What do you want? What do you mean? A support Metallica. The Metallica. Metallica. Or maybe it's a festival. Good for them. Oh, I'm so happy. Oh, that's really nice. So, Racino Rocks. What's coming up, James? Tell us. What's coming up in May? We have got... You My won't birthday. go... With, huh? My birthday. Dan's birthday. Oh, in May. I in thought May. you meant speci like a yeah. specific day. So Sorry. In, Sorry. May. <laughs> in May, in yeah. May. We've got. Oh yeah, we were both released in. You're May. both. You're yeah. both released in May. Yep. As well as. You won't go before you're supposed oh, to. But it'll be a 25th be anniversary for me as well. 25th anniversary reissue. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Continue. The plot and you with volume two EP. The cycles are trying to cope by like monster flames. You won't go before you're supposed to by not loose. From hell I rise, Kerry King slash orgy of the damned, and bad omens, concrete jungle remix. Well, it's obviously not loose, isn't it? But I'm going to say something. This is a podcast exclusive, what I'm about to say. I'm getting into Bad Omens. Interesting. But maybe I won't start with a remix album. That'd be ridiculous. So mm. I might actually listen to... I might listen to the... T no, I might recommend it. Do it. Let's do it. I might do it. Cheeky. We'll see what we'll happens with the recommendations at the end. But I've got another idea, so we'll see. But I'm getting into Bad Omens a bit. Which album do you think of recommending? The Death of Peace of Mind. But um, I haven't got too unfamiliar with that album to try and go round about in different ways. What the fuck are you trying to say? I've listened to it. Oh, okay. as well. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got too I was trying unfamiliar. To be like, I haven't got too unfamiliar. Really, with I'm trying to be real. Um, are you unfamiliar with What's the fucking words? What's the are words? Are you not unfamiliar with Ah, uh, yes. I'm unfamiliar with them. But I'm not unfamiliar. Um, Interesting. What's, I can't think of the fucking word. Nah, anyway. Yeah. But anyway, Not Loose is the one. Come on. I'm looking forward to the plot in you. That's going to be very good. There's a lot of exciting stuff Let's go there. different from that. A lot of exciting stuff there, and also Slash. <laughs> <laughs> and Carrie King. And Carrie King. Two, um, two old men daily missing their bedtime. I want to try and delve into like Monster Flames. We they're they're on the tour with Landmarks next month as well, which is probably going to be gig of the year for me. Um, yeah. 
I'm intrigued. I kind of want to look into that a bit more. But let us know down below what your most anticipated album for May is. As Alex goes for a wee. It's gonna be May. Gig talk time. This is where we talk about gigs. It is indeed. This month we went to Alex's first gig of the year, which is madness. Yeah. It wasn't madness. Is well, no, Manor. Was, no, Dream State was my first gig of the year. Oh, yeah, it was. And we my talked bad. about that last. Yeah, episode. we talked about that last time. Took you to your second yeah. gig of the year. You're going this mad month. Then. We went to Alex's second gig. It's because I've edited the Dream State vlog and it's mentioned that it's your first gig of the oh, year. Oh, right, fair enough. Um, we went to Alex's second gig of the year, Boston Manor. It was very good. It was very good. Uh, ice, ice cream, ice cream van mount side. Ice cream. It's exciting. We all, <laughs> <laughs> we all just wow. start to look wow. at each other. That was a real moment of genuine joy there. I think <laughs> we were all just taken back to our childhoods. Um, Boston Manor in Oxford. Well, always a pleasure when an alternative band comes to town, isn't it? And very proud to see it sell out. Not just the O2, but the big room. The, the big boy room. Upgraded. I think it was actually the biggest show on the tour in the end. Yeah. Because it was a, an, well in, an intimate venue tour. Yeah. And it was in basically our, our city's biggest venue. Mm. I will say that's it was the best experience I've had in that big room. I was about to say I for, for one of the shittest the places room. to go to, but it was really good. Yeah. It was probably the best time I've I've seen bands in there. Trivium in there was. What do you think rough. was different about it? I think maybe the crowd and maybe the genre. I think because I've seen some other like heavier bands down there because Trivium's down there and I saw Architects down there as well. I think maybe the nature of heavier music slightly brings about a different kind of person. Whereas this felt like, although there were like pits at certain points in Boston Manor, I think it had a much more chilled vibe. And I think just a better atmosphere going into it, I think made that a different experience hmm. uh, for the big room in particular. Whereas it, coincidentally, just talking about Oxford in general, I think one of the better Oxford crowds I've seen in total was actually Off Mice and Men in Oxford, um, yeah, that was which was towards one. the end of last year. Yeah, December last year. Yeah. I, that, I think that was one of the better Oxford crowds I've I've been part oh, of because they were good me. pits. Bring me to the Reading and Leeds warm up show, and it was mental. Big room. Yeah. How was it in there? Fucking manic. Was that a good big room experience? Yeah, brilliant. Got okay. got right to the front. I think that's did, the did thing with like, that venue. I'm, I'm going pit. Oh, I'm getting pit, mate. Sorry. Yeah. That's the thing with that venue. I think as long as you get to the front, yeah, get past the little bottlenecks created by the, by the bars then God help you if you need to get right. out for a wee though yeah just hold it in anyway the just gig piss, yeah yeah the gig um, it was really fun I think for me it was a reminder that Boston Manor are an excellent live band mm -hmm. like just the the sound is just so tight there's a there was obviously that issue with um, the, click their click and their in-ears at, at the start um, but I, I think I think it kind of just shows the. I don't know what I'm trying to say. They persevered. They, they they just yeah they persevered and they just sound fucking great. There's another reminder as well of what a brilliant front man Henry is. Mm -hmm. The way he just blends his voice between cleans and screams effortlessly and just commands the crowd as well. Uh, they're a brilliant band and I think I didn't quite realise. I think I had the same thing with Pup a few years ago. Boston Manor, a band that I didn't realise had grown quite that much. Mm -hmm. uh, like it wasn't, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago that, that I was seeing them in a venue in Swindon that had like a hundred and fifty capacity, and I don't think it sold out. Whereas seeing it flash forward now to them selling out the main room at O2 Academy, high up on festival bills. Things you love to see. They're flying, aren't they? I think that they're set at trees. The year before last, twenty two. 22 mm. when passenger had just come out they played it like it come out like the day before the trees that was when i first thought this band are gonna really like take off the way that they commanded the crowd then i was I yeah kind of I, I recall a massive wall of death yeah and that's it and ever since then it's been a, like a joy to see them like just grow and like keep proving us right that they're gonna be one of the biggest bands in the scene i think 
And the new singles. I was going to say, the really new singles good. were incredible live. And the other notable thing with the new singles, with the amount of time we've had them, as well as all the songs we had, the crowd were incredibly loud throughout. Mm. As you're hearing, mm. they started straight off with a container. Everyone is singing along and it was so incredibly loud from the get-go. Um because you can Amazing. tell when, when a band plays a new song and people haven't caught... Like when we saw um, The Story So Far and they opened with Big Blind, and you could tell people hadn't quite like really... They weren't caught on yet. yet. and caught on yet. Whereas this wasn't like that at all. It was loud. From, from, the, from the get-go. From the Sliding start. Doors as well had only been out for a few days. Mm. And it's just an instant banger, isn't it? Yeah. Very, very, very strong showing and kind of makes... Sliding Doors. Amazing. Uh, I think it makes it, especially coming out of that show, one of the most anticipated sets for trees, mm. especially in the forest. Forest headliner. And they've confirmed now, or at least they put the feelers out, that they're going to do a bit of a throwback set. And they have a headline tour later this year as well. Massive. With Trophy Eye supporting. Trophy Eye supporting. Maybe. It's insane. Maybe one of the best lineups for me in a very long time, those two bands together. Especially seeing as you just stuff. saw Trophy Eyes recently. Just saw Trophy Eyes recently. Lovely well. segue. Whoa. Not Whoa. a segue. Segue. Professional. Don't look directly at the segue. Um, We've ruined the segue We've now. ruined the segue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw Trophy Eyes in beautiful Birmingham. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever described Birmingham as beautiful. Hey, yeah. beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Yep. Uh, it was at the Asylum. First time I've been to that venue. And very... Very nice. Have you been? I think I have. It's is that the small room on the side of the institute? No, it's like on okay. an on an industrial estate. Then I haven't been there. Very nice venue. Very nice. Um, one of those ones that you can like sort of just magically see, kind of wherever you are. You know, sometimes when you go to a venue, and you're like, oh, I can't fucking see anything. Mm. But go to Academy Oxford. Go to Academy Oxford. <laughs> but sometimes you go to a venue and you're like, oh, it doesn't matter where I am, I'm going to have a decent view. It was like that. It was weird. Um, we didn't see the first support because we were having tapas. <laughs> and we only saw the last song of main support, which were Happy Days. But they sounded good. But um, Trophy Eyes' set was just... It, like, was the ultimate, like, pleaser for all. Like, there was such a good mix of, like, eras and albums and some proper throwbacks. A lot of the new stuff, which sounded brilliant. Um... And it's just really interesting to see, like, how different, how the audience sort of reacts to different songs as they come up. Like, you could kind of, like, pinpoint, like, certain people going, like, absolutely ape shit for the older stuff. But then the sing-alongs for the newer stuff was also really, really loud and really fun. So, just brilliant. And I think the main takeaway for me was, like... The tapas. The tapas was really good. No, the main takeaway for me was, like, I feel very lucky that I've seen a lot of bands that I love, but I also get to have a lot of uh, really nice moments where I see... I'm at gigs or festivals with people that I love, and I get to see them at their happiest after seeing a band that they love. Like, I've seen you after The One Years a bunch of times. I've seen James after Slip Not A Download and sets like that. And so to see my girlfriend after Trophy Eyes at a headline show especially after how long we've waited to see them, was like that same feeling of like, it wasn't just my enjoyment that was special about this, it was hers as well. So I think that elevates it when you're seeing a band or uh, you're watching a live set with someone who loves it as much as you or maybe even more, it kind of makes the whole experience a bit more cherished. So it was nice, yeah. That's very nice. Oh, thank you. And that's it, isn't it? So, James was on a train. <laughs> I was on a train. I was listening to music. And... Oh, and you thought, oh, pr- pretty colour. Pretty, pretty colours. Pretty, pretty aesthetic. Looking at kind of album artwork and just thinking a little bit about discussions we've had actually already this year. In terms of just visuals, graphics... How last year was kind of dead, but it feels like some bands this year are making a bit more an effort mm. with how they present themselves, and in particular with album artwork. 
It's and often a category at different awards things it as is, well, and which, it's not, which is one that we've overlooked. It is, yeah. We've not delved into it as much. And so I think just having a bit of a talk about it and certain ones that stand out, whether they be, we feel they're iconic in general and they just stand the test of time or if they're ones in particular that are favourites to us that hold like a special place, maybe it's because of a certain album or just so memorable you remember seeing it when you bought that album. Um so, for example, I'll kick off with one for me, um, where I think it's both for that, and it's American Idiot. I remember seeing the album cover and hearing the music and falling in love with it, but I think it's some, one that in particular just stands out so strong, and you think of Green Day, I think you can think of that album artwork immediately, and the heart holding the hand grenade with the blood dripping down as well on the hands. It's something that I was drawn to, and I remember as a kid, I remember listening to the album and tracing the front cover of the CD. So I like drew a copy of it because my actual art skills were fucking shit. So like it was something that just stuck with me so much in terms of the enjoyment of the album in more than just in the music. Um, and I need to get the vinyl of it soon. So I'll be I know knocking on truck store. Do you guys have anything where instantly, like, the first thing of an album artwork just jumps out at you? I think, I, I don't know why, because, but it's, it's neck deep. I was not out to get you. There's just <laughs> something about the artwork for that album, and that album in general, that for that era of pop punk is just iconic. And that artwork is almost like the perfect style for that album as well. Like I it, can, it, al- yes, it almost yeah. it almost just makes sense. I can look at the album artwork and I can hear the songs. Yeah, immediately. Exactly. And I do think as well, not to the same degree. I think they did do something similar with the piece in the panic. I think I can yeah. look at that album artwork. I don't think it's the same level, hmm. not at all. But I think I can look at that and it's it's very it stands out very strongly. It's definitively them. And also, I can hear the songs just by looking at it. Yeah, and I think it's the same for the self titled as as well, the recent one. I yeah. really like the artwork on that. I like the sort of bubble writing of the Neck Deep logo. Part of that resurgence like, this year. I like the cartoon style. Mm-hmm. I think that's a very cool album album artwork as well. But back to Life's Not Out to Get You. Uh, interestingly, that's by an artist called Ricardo Cavolo. And it's not the only album artwork that he's ever designed. He's also done an album for uh, a Canadian producer slash rapper called Kay Trinada. And if you look it up, you can see it's got the, like the signature fire logos and stuff. So it's a very striking art style, I think, and one that's immediately recognisable. Yeah. Not just not just for his style, but also as neck deep. Mm-hmm. Agreed. I think it's an interesting thing because it's hard sometimes. I've been trying to think of some for this discussion, and I think it kind of like sometimes it works retroactively, where the album is so good that the artwork becomes iconic because of it. For ex- like The first one that came to mind was Peripheral Vision because mm. you looking at that album, really, you can hear it. It's the same thing. You can hear yeah, it. Yeah, I literally can. I, I can hear, um, but hear it I, in my head now. I, part of me thinks like if, if the music on that wasn't what it is, does the artwork still f- make that mm. feel, feel as iconic? So I don't know. It's an interesting... Uh, it's an interesting one for me to try and wrap my head around about. I guess the more you listen to first. an album, I guess the more you listen to an album, the more that you see the artwork. Yeah. So the more you're exposed to it, the more significant it com- becomes to you anyway. As far as, you know, immediate iconic ones that come to mind, I think Vulgar Display of Power by Pantera is a huge one. Like, it's a very... And I think what you know, you have to think about like at that time. And I guess it, it's kind of come around again, but that was a time where people were going to like record stores and like thumbing through albums and picking shit up without knowing it and just looking at it. Vulgar display of power tells you exactly what that album is going to be before you even put it on. Yeah, and I think that might be kind of the ultimate. To me, maybe that's the ultimate test of like, if I don't know this band what vibe am I going to get? And sometimes it's a good thing for it to be clear. Sometimes it's good for it to be kind of vague because you can look at an album cover and have no idea what it's going to sound like or you can be like completely misdirected by it. But I think with things like that, the Rage Against the Machine, self-titled, um, with the self-immolation photo is obviously mm-hmm. 
massively iconic. Um, and then you've got some of like some of the obvious ones, like Master of Puppets, Nevermind. Uh, Abbey, I think Nevermind is up there. Yeah, yeah. that's got to be like top three most iconic album covers, it's, isn't it? They almost like transcend the band and the music. They become its own like cultural thing. Um, There's probably people that know those album covers that couldn't name you a single song off the album. Yeah, yeah, definitely become so culturally significant. Yeah. Mm. Um, you mentioned one from this year, Neck Deep, and I want to bring another one up, which is current album of the year, pending, depending on what else comes out, and it's Alpha Wolf with Half Living Things. I think it's a, a one that immediately, as soon as the artwork kind of came out, there was so much talk about it, the way it kind of stands out, that you can tell by the design that's gone into it. Uh, it's been well thought out. A band that in particular kind of, as introduced in the subjects, have been dis- discussing and we've talked about quite a lot in length about the visuals they've done this year, the music videos they've put out, the, the time and attention they've put into how they appear from music, generally, visually. And I think that this is an album that stands out very strong. The excitement when I got the vinyl to look at it and actually have that visual in front of me. Um, yeah, absolutely incredible. And I think it, it's something that shows this resurgence now coming through. Another one that I've got, which is a bit more of a throwback, would be uh, Nightmare by Avenged Sevenfold. I think. Nightmare. Interesting, because w- my thought was self-titled. Your thought was self-titled? Just so so striking to be just the death bat on the white background. See, I find that the the homage you have within that on the tombstone of Forever for the Rev, um, with that kind of looming presence in the background, just the whole, again, you hear it and you see it, you think of the songs. Um, quite similarly, I can look at the album cover and I can just hear most of that album straight away from the time that I spent with it. And I think that just stands out as something very strong and visual. Um, just kind of harkens back to a little bit of my childhood immediately. Um, another one that comes to mind is my favourite album, Iowa. I remember seeing a bit of like documentary around the time of them having the goat head and yeah. having the nails in the wall and then pinning it up against there and then getting the photographer to come and take the photo. So the kind of the backstory of seeing how they made it as well as having that attachment to the album with it, I very visually kind of remember that and can picture it straight away. Um, and it just kind of stands out, I think, in the test of time, really. You mentioned vinyl, James, and... One of the the ways I kind of jogged my memory for this debate was to uh, look through my vinyl collection because I think that's a one of the prominent things with having a vinyl collection is you've got the artwork there mm-hmm. on like a big like twelve by twelve inch piece of cardboard or, or whatever it's come in. Yeah, you can sort of display it while you're playing the album. So I went through my vinyl collection and. I realise I really like the um, album artwork on Hot Mulligan's You'll Be Fine. I think it's yeah. just, there's just something nice about that image. Again, it matches the music as well. Uh, James won't be aware of it. It looks like this. Do you look at that and think of Flora? Kind of. I think it's just nice. It's just... It seems quite a, wholesome. A faceless guy there with a sweater and some, some glasses and a cap on, just sat with a dog looking out over a lovely little lake. There's just something really nice about that, I think. I'm partial to an album cover, which is just a photo of something. Which is why I like basically every modern baseball album cover. Um, But in particular, Holy Ghost, because it's just a photo of a moment. I can't remember the exact story of it. I think it's, it's come from while they're out on tour somewhere. But there's just like a Walmart or something in the background. Or they're taking a photo on a disposable, and I think it's very cool. And I kind of like the simplicity of it, that it's almost like not putting as so much thought into it just to let the music do the talking, but also being a visually appealing and simple piece of work to go alongside it as well. But more specifically, album artwork that's just pictures of a house. <laughs> <laughs> what a great genre. <laughs> Aaron West and the Roaring Twenties. Yep. They do that on every album. 
apart from the new one, which is a caravan. Um, but still a house. The, the big one, of course, is American football, of course. And all three of those albums are just iconic, particularly the the first one. Yeah. And I mean, you can hear a riff from seeing a picture of the top half of a house. Mm. Crazy. How mad is and, that? And like people visit it now as well. And yeah. Shit. And like I think it was for sale recently. It was for sale, and I think the band like bought it mm. so that it wouldn't get like knocked down or demolished or anything. So yeah, that's iconic for sure. I think you have that to house like generally belongs in like a museum. Yeah. I think as well you have to really like consider bands and albums that like define genres. So for example, like for me, um, there are two albums by Dark Throne. A Blaze in the Northern Sky and Transylvanian Hunger, which look like this is one of them. And that is the other one. And it's like some like black metal covers now are kind of like meme or almost like it's almost like a template to follow. But like it's because of albums like that that were so like striking visually at the time that they came out that like people just cling to that that aesthetic and it becomes like just the the trend and the standard, but yeah, those albums like really as well capture just absolute crushing despair, which is what that music sounds like. And the same goes for like um people might be in the comments telling me that there's bands before that did this, but like Cannibal Corpse in the way that their artwork is very, yeah. very visceral and visceral and striking to look at and quite horrible. But at the same time it became, you know, like the gold standard for that type of music. And also it perfectly lets you know what you're going to listen to when you've got like skeletons with you know I don't need to describe it we've seen Cannibal Corpse album covers <laughs> should we talk about the, the Mayhem one it was a bootleg so we don't need to I, I, maybe we should because it is uh, iconic for a reason do you know about this Dan no I don't think I do let me paint you a picture you're the Mayhem fan Alex talk, talk uh, me through it paint me a picture with words so Mayhem had a singer called uh, who went by the stage name Dead, who had a fascination with being dead uh, to the point where he would like bury his stage clothes and then dig them up so that they had a rotting smell and look to them. Okay. Uh, one day he committed suicide in like a shared band house that they had. The guitarist came home and found him, and uh, instead of calling the police, he took photos of his body and rearranged stuff in the room to even like make it more uh not photogenic what's the word maybe photo yeah i don't know I guess, kind yeah. aesthetically pleasing aesthetically pleasing um as much as you can do in that situation and then that photo ended up becoming the cover of a bootleg uh album called dawn of the black hearts i think it's called damn and it that's is that's why i can't find it on spotify it is uh <laughs> literally their singer dead with his brain out wow and that's black metal it's one of those it kind of doesn't look real yeah it, it's so crazy that you don't think it is what it is mm. do you know what I mean but it is one from late 90s that stands out strong to me and it, it makes me think of the music video straight away is Follow the Leader by Korn I see that I see the girl playing Hopscotch uh, like on the cliff edge and immediately it just kind of throws me back to listening to that song delving into 90s new metal i i hear the sound of jonathan davis's like scat vocals immediately in my head um feel these bass lines all that kind of thing and i think that's one in particular that was very iconic in that 90s new metal era that stands out very strongly i, I think the self-titled more striking with the shadow looming over I think that's, the it's another one. I think they're a band that have done a few. Um, also fallen short on a few, I think. But um, no, that self-titled is, is a strong one as well. You boys aware of a band called Cap a Cattle Decapitation? I have heard the I name. Am, yes. Mm. Uh, there's an album of theirs that makes me wonder the how the creative process went, whether they had the artwork first or the name first or whether they decided they wanted this sort of artwork with this name paired together they released an album in 2004 called human yore wow yeah wow that's um yeah that's not going on youtube 
But Google yeah. humanure Maybe by Calvin We might Coach. be able to put it in the Ragamuffin Club. Mm. Without context. It's <laughs> 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 in there now. Before we didn't uh, finish recording this episode. Oh, that was about so yeah, to, that's, that was It's, about it's to obviously on. very creative, isn't it? They've got the title Human Your and how, how can we make this human manure? Oh yeah, let's literally do that. Sometimes albums can be iconic in a bad way. They can be shit or associated with a bad album. But maybe nothing is worse than Metallica for load and reload. The album cover is a mix of blood and semen. Thanks for listening to the Ragnarok Music Ragnar. Podcast. Uh, <laughs> is that one of the worst decisions a band has ever made? Possibly. Is it worse mm-hmm. than Mayhem Guitarist taking a picture of the dead vocalist? Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. Kids, 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 kids these days can't stay off their phones. They have to take photos of everything. <laughs> one that I'll bring up, which will be hilarious seeing as how much you're a fan now and how much you enjoyed their set of download. I remember as a kid, you oh, I know what you're saw about to say. an album cover yep. of Kiss. Yeah. And it scared the shit out of I you did. as a kid. Scared the absolute <laughs> shit out of me to the point where... You had nightmares. I had a nightmare. And this is how vivid the memory is. Our parents weren't home that night. We had family friends babysitting us. And I sat on the stairs and refused to go to bed until my parents got home because I was so scared. And it was the Which cover one? of, I think it might just be the Dynasty cover, mm. which is, you know. Nothing. It's just straight it's up, it's just them there. The band. But it was, was Gene something. Simmons, I think. And the fact that, like, his face is just sort of coming out of just blackness, do you know what mm. I mean? It's just the striking white face. Probably scared the shit out. Well, it did scare the shit out of me as a kid. I remember that. Um, but the but first but song on that album. you still love them to this day. I love them to this day. And also, the first song on that album is I Was Made For Loving You. So maybe if we just put the album on, I would have immediately have be gotten fine. over it. <laughs> yeah, that was iconic for me in Alex Law. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I became obsessed with them. So Funny old world. I don't think I've ever been scared of an album cover. No. That's a, that's a, that's a new mm. one. Any others come to mind? Well, one, oh. of, one of the first albums I ever bought physically was Infinity on High by Fall Out Boy, which has a sheep in... Like a bedroom on the cover, mm. so that's that's quite a memorable one for me, I suppose. Not necessarily iconic in the grand scheme of things, but in Dan Law, <laughs> <laughs> because I bought I bought that CD because I tried to buy. I'm sure I've told this story before. I tried to buy um, Black Parade yeah. by My Chemical Romance, but it had a parental advisory sticker on it, and I was what like ten probably, so I was told I couldn't have it. But I wanted to buy a CD, so I bought the Fallout Boy one instead. But also, crucially, your dad was in the shop. Oh, yeah, my he dad was just up Yeah, the my dad was the there. Yeah. The guy at the counter was like, you got, you got your parents with you? And I gestured towards my dad, and they were having none of it. Didn't believe me. Why didn't he just come over? Don't know. Too busy. Doing dad things, you know. Doing dad there, fair enough. One that I think... I, say, I was about to say it doesn't get enough credit, but it won a heavy music award for artwork. But uh, Malevolence, most recent album. Uh, yeah. all that yeah, all their artwork to be fair that, come that to most mind. recent one is I was going to do some research because I feel like that guy has also done some of their artwork I think just he's some similar stuff yeah. uh, let me take a look I guess this is topical while, while Dan's looking at um, because I've just opened Twitter and saw a tweet about it but uh, someone just said how is Take Me Back to Eden a nominee for the Heavy Music Awards this year um, and I guess this sort of circles back to like the the thing of like does the album itself like inform how iconic the artwork is because it is one of the best albums of like modern heavy music but i don't think the artwork's all that much and if anything i, I would say that impressive. i would say the uh this place will become your tomb artwork's probably i better. think that's much better yeah uh, the thing i like about the artwork for tomb is that it kind of encapsulates the whole feeling of being underwater mm. that the music puts across as well Whereas I guess this one is so sort of simple and blank that it leaves it a bit more open. But I, I don't think it's it an icon. Then, I don't think it's a particularly. Is it just a the hyperbole around the album? Yeah, and that's what's just putting it in the discussion. But I think it makes it. In, that's what makes it interesting is whether or not sort of how your brain works as far as what makes it iconic. I suppose. 
Uh, so yeah, answering the question of the malevolence, malicious intent album cover. Um, the artist is a fella called Eliran Cantor, um, and he has done a bloody loads of albums. Um, he's done albums for Testament, My Dying Bride, Halloween, Soulfly, Hate Breed, Venom Prison, Thy Art Is Murder. But yeah, they've done a lot. It's almost like Renaissance style artwork, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I really like it. Which is why I like uh, some of the Acacia Strains album covers as well. Well, I feel like this is a topic we could easily do a, a part two on. Mm. If we were to think about it, it's about a bit more. Yeah. Let us know in the comments if we missed any obvious ones. Maybe we'll mention them in the next episode. Well, not the next episode, but the next time we do this discussion. You could even let us know some we've missed uh, by commenting in the Ragamuffin Club, our Facebook group, which you can find in the description. Um, a few people in the group have mentioned some. They have indeed. Uh, Jamie Bullock said, Creeper, Eternity in Your Arms. Um, is one of the best. Mm. It's not iconic in, in the traditional sense, but it's been a personal favourite from the day of release. And it is a bloody good cover. I think Creeper, have d- all their covers have been quite nice, actually. Yeah. Um, but I think what they do really well is they make each album have its own identity as far as, like, themes and sound. And I think that extends into, like, their artwork. And their, like, f- visual representation. Cause they've changed up their look a few times. Um, so I like that one. Tom said, Iron Maiden, Somewhere in Time. Lots of Easter eggs on their, of their songs can be found on the cover. And he's posted, like, what I assume is the, I guess, the full cover if you have, like, the vinyl version. Um, it would, like, extend out. And there is a lot. Like, you could tell that someone's really fucking put the time and effort into this one. Um, and I think a lot of Iron Maiden albums are quite, quite iconic to look at. Not to listen to, though. <laughs> Definitely not. And then Edward said, iconic, fairly generic, but things like Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, Joy Division, Unknown Pleasures. But as far as ones I love, Veil of Myers' Mother from last year, which was a really cool album cover. Yeah, very true, actually. And he also said, love, li- love Limp Biscuit's Significant Other. I don't know if they'll achieve iconic status. I just like the art style. I think Significant Other's fucking pretty iconic. That's just reminded me of The Prodigy, um, The Fat of the Land, um, yeah, with, with the, the crabs. Crab. Yeah. Is it... It's just one crab, isn't it? Then I'll just the one crab. Just the actually. One cra- <laughs> Brilliant. I guess that just about wraps it up for iconic album covers. Yeah, and that wraps up so. for this episode. Let us know down below anything in particular that stands out for you, whether it's a personal one, whether it's one you think is absolutely just iconic for album covers, and then also maybe we talk about music videos and we continue the visual discussion at some point in the future. So if you like that. Let us know down below. Subscribe to the channel as always. Always plenty of great things coming on the channel. What we got on the channel, boys? Vlogs. Vlogs. There's Many some, vlogs. There's some that are probably just coming out as you're listening to this now. Go watch them. We've got plenty coming up this summer. There'll be vlogs of festival season. You're going to see us around anywhere. Come and say hello. We'll have to chat about music in person as well as online, which makes you want to join the Ragamuffin Club. So the link is down below. Go and click on that. We've got a small community that's growing where we talk about all kinds of different things like music. Uh, it's just a better forum than YouTube discussion comments, really, isn't mm. it? Anything I'm missing? Just the album, Rex. Great outro, but we've got one more segment. <laughs> oh, fuck, here we do. Uh, Alex, go on then. Wait a second, you've def- not prepared def- for. No, 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 I've got an idea. <laughs> I, I have an idea in mind, but... I think Dan might recommend the same thing as me. So I want him to go first and see if he says the same one. See, I have decided it's time to immerse the two of you into the world of Aaron West. So what I'm going to do over the next three months... Oh, Christ. <laughs> it's a project. Is, ...is share the Aaron West story with you. Um, and what I, what I want to happen is that you only listen to that one album for that month. I don't want you to skip ahead. I want you to just appreciate that album and then we'll move on to the next one. Because Dan, who is Aaron, is complicated, um, has said himself that the Aaron West story is a bit like live wrestling mixed with a TV show. And it's best to kind of experience it as like a series. So like binge it. And then wait for the next series to be released. Yeah, sort of thing. exactly yeah. like that. So this month's recommendation is Aaron West and the Roaring Twenties. We don't have each other.
Nice. And I'm really intrigued to see how the two of you. I think it's, it's going to be much more Alex's thing than it is James's. But mm-hmm. James, you, I always like that you come at things with like a a music theory kind of perspective. Yeah. So I'm an, intrigued to hear your thoughts on that and just your general thoughts on the story because it really like genuinely immerses you into a, a really really interesting world and an interesting way of story of storytelling through songwriting. Okay. So buckle in for buckle in and three you guys were... and the people listening can join in as well. Is this going to be something you're going to want a review of like each month or do you want to just build the most accumulative thing and you get like one big one no, no one, 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 one each <laughs> one each each time okay. we'll do it each month All and right. then because it, it tells a story and it comes to a, a nice end as well on the most recent album okay which is why I don't want you to skip ahead either Alex does that impact you then it does not impact me but I'm surprised because I thought we were going to say the same thing okay I am going to be recommending an album based off a band who have just announced that it's going to be remixed, remastered and revisited along with some shows in 2025. It is The Blackest Beautiful by Let Live. I, part of me thinks this might have actually been recommended way back, but we've done so many episodes of these I can't remember. Um, but this album's fantastic. I'm really... Uh, it, feels like we never got to say a proper goodbye to Let Live. Um, and as much as I love the new projects that he's been a part of, this is still my favourite thing that Jason Butler's done. And this is my favourite album by them. So, uh, yeah, it's got to be this. And hopefully, nice. I know that Dan already likes it. Hopefully James enjoys it and we can all go to the uh, the shows next year together. Oh, yeah. Mine is finding out, in kind of a similar account, I guess, we found out recently that an old band we used to listen to of metalcore uh, are coming back from a hiatus. They're from Holland. They're a smaller band called The Royal. Nice. Um, we found out kind of fairly similar and we're in the gym together recently and we're both just kind of listening to their music while while training, which was just quite funny. Um, so a nice throwback to one of their albums, which is Dreamcatchers, um, full of a lot of fun riffs. I think this band had so much potential always kind of went back and listened to their music and it's nice to see that they're making a comeback um, after quite a bit of time away and that hopefully they come back nice and strong. We saw them over six years ago in London in a very small show. Really, really stuck it stood out as a, as a fun night and they were good live. I wish them all the best and um, enjoyed reminiscing. Yeah, for sure. And that's about it. James has already basically done an outro, so... Listen to the album, Rex. Tell us your thoughts in the comments. Join the Ragamuffin Club. Shitload of vlogs and other fun videos on the channel. Just go check it out.